Good morning, everyone. This is David and Sue. I'm LDS Prepper, and we have Mrs. LDS Prepper, also known as the Backyard Herbalist, here this morning. Glad to have you here. And uh, we are here today to talk about herbs, and specifically how to use herbs for first aid. But I have a couple announcements, first of all, before we get started. First, uh, I'm most excited is that my quail will be hatching on Monday. I've got 110 quail in the incubator. I put them in two weeks ago today, and uh, they should be hatching Monday. I put an a announcement in Craigslist. I've got people coming to pick up uh, baby quail chicks, and I will be replacing the, the layers and the roosters that I have now with a, a new set of quail. So I'll have a new flock here shortly. So I'll have somewhere around 50 or so layers here in about six weeks, and I'll be um, uh, in the egg production business and uh, filling those orders for my commercial and residential uh, customers. Second thing is, it's snowing here, which is what I've been waiting. The weather's been great for the last week or so, and it is now snowing. So we're back into winter. I expect snow through April into May. It's been a really mild winter here, but um, I know with these with this warm weather, I've gotten this garden bug. I want to get out there and get the garden going, but I know because I've done this before, don't get too early on it, and the plants just sit there and they're they're cold, and so they don't grow very well. So if you do have the garden bug and you do want to um, start your garden then what I recommend that you do is you plant your seedlings inside your house where it's kind of a constant uh, even temperature and uh, where you have uh, you don't necessarily need a heat mat you can but you definitely need grow lights so that's uh, something to consider that if you are ready to get things going and you're in a cold climate I think we're in 5a is that what we're in yeah all right so that's uh, all the news right now I will turn the time over to my wife. She is, uh, as you'll see here on the slide, a master herbalist, um, a, a master chef. Um, <laughs> she's a master grandma. She's a master of many things. So I'm just going to pull this down here so you can see the slides and let her take over. There we go. And uh, at the end of this, if you will post your questions. In the uh, question morning, box, this is David and Sue. I'm LDS let me turn Pepper off my speaker. Uh, I'm going to turn that off. There we go. And uh, put a question. If you'd write uh, Sue in the question or, uh, yeah, let me just adjust that for you so you can see. Put Sue in the question or put... Um, Question in all capitals so I can uh, see what the questions are and we can come back and we will answer those questions here in a minute. All right, so here you are. Here's my sweetheart and your guest host, guest today for the presentation. Good morning, everyone. Today I'm talking about 20 essential first aid kit herbs, herbs that some of them are weeds, some of them will you can wildcraft in this area. So, um, all of them can be cultivated in this area. And if they can be cultivated here, it's like they can be cultivated where you live. First off, once again, let you know I'm not a licensed physician or a health practitioner. And the information offered in this presentation is for education and entertainment purposes only, should not be taken as medical advice. These views are mine and should not be taken as an endorsement of any product or practice. And you should always seek the advice of a qualified medical practitioner before using herbs therapeutically. Herbs can and do interact with pharmaceutical or over-the-counter drugs. So you should always run anything you want to do by your health practitioner, especially if you're taking any kind of medication. Make sure there's not going to be any interaction between the two. Oftentimes, herbs can and do work synergistically with medications, but you need to check with your health practitioner and make sure before you do anything. So 
So I do have a website in progress. Uh, most of the, well, all of the medicinal weeds that grow around here, I've got uh, more detailed information on my website, thebackyardherbalistschool.com. I am in the process of getting more information up onto that website, so check back often and check in on the progress. So even though we're talking uh, about 20 essential first aid kit herbs here today, these herbs have over 250 first aid applications or other health benefits. And all of those details are in my first aid kit herbs resource manual, which is available at the LDS Prepper Store, ldsprepperstore.com. All of my manuals are currently discounted and there's a bundle price if you want to get all four. Uh, before we get into the herbs, I wanted to talk about a couple of first aid kit solutions that you might be interested in. This is called a, a backdoor apothecary. It's just a plastic shoe bag that you can get on Amazon or probably places like uh, Walmart or Target. And you just hang it up on the back side of a door that's handy, in a handy location, central to the kitchen, in a hallway, somewhere where you can get to quickly when you need to grab first aid herbs. Uh, well, uh, this idea came from a good friend of mine who teaches basic first aid herbal classes here locally. She came up with this idea and I absolutely love it. I copied it. I <coughs> got uh, some six inch by nine inch resealable mylar bags from Amazon, made labels, put some instructions on them. And yep, this one has, there's 24 herbs that you can store in this bag. So that when, and you just need to put a cup or two cups of herbs in those bags. And anytime there's a first aid emergency, you've got the herbs on hand. You grab them, you make a tea, you make a poultice, you do whatever you need to with them. And uh, you've got your first aid cabinet. Very handy. Love it. Um, during the early spring and summer and fall, I teach my two granddaughters uh, about herbs. And we, we work in the herb garden. We, I teach them a, about an herb a month and we make remedies and I gave them a shoe bag and they love having the, the, the medicine where they can get to it. They love it when somebody gets hurt. They run to the shoe bag, they grab an ointment, they grab an herb, and they go help them. They love that. So it's a really handy, really great idea. Uh, this is a, a travel first aid kit. It's just a toiletry bag that you can, there's all kinds of different sizes and, and shapes and uh, available on Amazon, you get one that uh, you you like, and you fill it with real small bottles of in small containers of herbs. Throw in some band aids, whatever you think you might need, or you what you would not want to be without when you are traveling, and keep that in a little kit that you take with you whenever you travel. I did this uh, when we went to Tahiti in January and was real glad that I had it. <clears throat> These are ammo bags, ammo and gun range bags. They come in many sizes. They have lots of compartments. Uh, it makes for a great family travel kit, a, a car kit, a trauma kit, a birthing kit. Uh, you can customize these bags to whatever your needs are, you and your family, whatever you need. Great way to keep herbs on hand, handy for, for the family. So let's dig in. The first herb on the list is aloe vera. 
Now, aloe vera is not a plant that you can grow outdoors here in southeastern Idaho and have it survive the winter, but hens and chicks are a, a plant that will survive the winter. I've actually got some hens and chicks in my herb garden and and they do survive the winter. They both have the, the same uh, medicinal properties. Aloe vera is good to keep in a pot in the house. It makes a good house plant. It's great. You're probably familiar with this. It's great for burns and that's what it's used for uh, mostly. Most People know that it's used for burns, but it is also a great cell proliferant, which means that it stimulates cells to, to replicate faster, which is really good when you've got a wound that needs to be healed. That wound will heal faster if you put aloe vera on it. So the part that is used is the gel in the leaves. It is... Uh, the leaves are not edible. The juice from the plant is edible and it's highly nutritious. But I highly recommend that you buy purified, decolorized, low anthraquinone juice rather than juicing the leaves yourself because the anthraquinones in the gel are extremely laxative. And unless you need an extremely powerful laxative, I don't recommend that you juice this yourself. The, the juice is available commercially, and if you want to take it for culinary nutritive purposes, that's a good way to do it. The one thing that I have found with the hens and chicks is that the, the leaves on the plant are thinner and smaller, and so they're not going to contain as much gel as the, the bigger aloe vera leaves. Um, but if you're interested in growing this in your herb garden and having that on hand on a continual basis year-round, this is a good one for doing that if you live in a northern climate. Next up we have arnica. Arnica is a really good herb for painful injuries, things like bruises, swelling, it provides topical pain relief, it's even been used for arthritis, it has anti-inflammatory properties and typically an herb that has anti-inflammatory properties is going to be somewhat helpful for pain. The flowers, the roots, and the leaves are the medicine. It is not an edible plant. In fact, it can be toxic if it's used or taken internally. So don't uh, don't make it into a tea. I have turned this into a liniment, which is like a tincture, uh, but it's made with rubbing alcohol instead of ethanol alcohol. Uh, you can make it with you can make a tincture with ethanol with this, but uh, why go to that expense when you're not going to drink it, you're not going to take it internally. So it works really well in it, uh, rubbing alcohol. So I have used this, I keep this on hand, especially when I'm working outside in the garden. A few years ago I was staking out something with garden stakes and a five pound sledgehammer. I don't know that you would call it a sledgehammer, but five mallet, five pound mallet. And I was holding holding the garden stake and pounding the top of the garden stake into really hard soil. And I missed the top of the stake and I hit myself right in between my index and thumb. And it hurt really, really bad. So I immediately grabbed the Arnica liniment that I had and I just squirted some of that onto the area and rubbed it in and never got a bruise. It didn't discolor. The, it prevented the, the capillaries that are close to the surface of the skin from breaking 
and, and that's what causes the bruising. Uh, the pain went away. There was no, maybe a little redness, but uh, the anti-inflammatory properties kicked in real fast and uh, great, great herb to have on hand. Next up, Brigham tea. This is a plant that grows um, mostly in the south. A local garden center started carrying this plant a couple of years ago and sold out within days um, after I had get, given a presentation on it. So I haven't heard from those who bought it if they've been able to get it to grow up here. I ordered some plants years ago when we first moved here and and they all died on me and what I heard was that they need to be planted in the most poor rocky dry inhospitable soil that you've got on your property and neglected and then they will thrive so it's a it's kind of a desert plant it is a great antihistamine so that makes it good for different types of allergies, cold and flu symptoms, runny noses, leaky fluids. It's good for asthma, bronchitis. It has helped with whooping cough. It is a central nervous system stimulant. And you can use the leaves, the roots, or the stems. It's the, 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 spiny, the spiny parts. Um, <clears throat> I have made this into tincture and to tea and use them both that way. I found that it's really hard to measure these these sticks. Uh, standard tea infusion calls for a heaping teaspoon of herb per cup of boiled distilled water. And because these sticks, they're they're these le the leaves are like sticks, so I like to. Uh, I like to cut them up into small pieces and keep them in a mason jar so that when I do need it, it is easier to scoop out with a measuring spoon instead of trying to guess how many sticks make a heaping teaspoon. So a little tip there for, for using it. Uh, my son who has seasonal allergies has used this and it has helped with that. Calendula is probably one of the herbs that I would never want to be without. It has anti-inflammatory and antimicrobial properties. It is really good for wounds. It is good for insect bites and stings, for infections. It's a good lymphatic. I have a lymphatic formula that I use that has calendula in it. It helps stop bleeding. It, it has a lot of good first aid applications and benefits. The, me the medicine is found in the center and the base of the flower. So where the, you, where the, the base of the flower meets the stem, that's where the, the medicine is and that's what you want to make sure that you get into your medicine when you make it. If you buy dried herbs from a source, you'll probably get a lot of petals and not a lot of the, the bases of the flower. So if you have a chance to see the herbs before you buy them, make sure that you get that base in there. Otherwise, the petals are just good for uh, pot herbs or throw them in a salad. They have a peppery flavor. They make a good addition to a soup or a stew or a salad or you can throw them into smoothies too without a problem. Really good herb to have on hand. I'm really, uh, when I taught my granddaughters about this herb, we took some of the flowers and we made what's called golden oil and then turned that into an ointment and added some good smelling essential oils to that and the, the girly girls just love whenever they can use their their golden uh, golden oil catnip 
Really good herb to have on hand if you have young kids, especially babies. It's a very mild sedative and a digestive aid, which makes it really good for colic. And good for parents, because if your baby can sleep, then so can you. The, the leaves are the medicine. It is a good uh, culinary herb as well. You can put it into sauces, into stews, soups, even uh, dessert. I think in my reference manual I include a recipe for um, using these in a, in a dessert way. I think you coat them with an egg white water solution and then sprinkle some uh, organic sugar on it, let it dry, and then you can just eat the leaves that way as a dessert. It's also good for constipation, for the cramping and bloating that come from di up digestive upsets. It's uh, famous for being a good diaphoretic herb, which means that it will help with fevers. If you're having a difficult time breaking a fever, then catnip tea will get you through that and resolve the, the fever. Uh, your body raises its temperature for a purpose. I don't believe in interfering with that purpose, but if your body has a hard time resolving what it's trying to do, then catnip will help it complete that process. Really good for teething in infants and has some pain relief pain relieving qualities that can help with headaches. Cayenne is, and this goes for not just this kind of pepper, but any pepper that has some heat to it. They are good uh, hemostatic herbs, which means they stop bleeding. They will stop a heart attack. They will turn shock around. They will turn you around if you go into hypothermia. Uh, my daughter-in-law was, after she had her second baby, she was anxious to get back into shape. And so after six or eight weeks, she started an exercise routine. Got up early one morning and when she could exercise without interruption, got going on the treadmill, and not long into her routine she started feeling lightheaded and faint, and actually did faint, and my son grabbed the cayenne tincture, put a few drops in her mouth, brought her back, and she started screaming at him, what did you do to me? <laughs> of course, cayenne, hot pepper, it, that strength is, is really potent. But it snapped her out of the faint. It turns out, as they thought about it, she had not hydrated well in the morning and she was exercising on an empty stomach. And that was probably not a good thing for her to do at that point in her recovery process from childbirth. Lots of stories out there, especially from Dr. Christopher, about how he used this herb to stop heart attacks, to uh, correct hypothermia. Cayenne is a really good herb for equalizing blood pressure. So that's how it stops bleeding. It just normalizes blood pressure throughout the body, helps stop heart attacks, strokes. It's good for colds and flu and headaches and indigestion and depression and arthritis as well. So it's got lots of different, I mean, it's famous for, it's uh, cardiovascular properties, but it's got lots of other uses as well. So, and I talk about those in my reference manual. Of course, it has culinary value. You can throw it into anything, entrees, uh, soups. You can make it into tea, uh, throw it into smoothies, put it on pizza. It's a great condiment to add to anything if you like spicy foods. German chamomile is another herb that I would probably never want to be without. It is a nervine, which means it has an effect on the central nervous system. It is not a it is not strong enough to be sedative, just strong enough to be calmative. 
and it's really good for gastrointestinal issues, digestive issues. It is a bitter herb, which means you can use it as a, a bitter. Make a tea with this or take a tincture 15, 20, 30 minutes before you eat a meal, and that will just set up the whole digestive tract for good digestion. Helps the body release the enzymes and digestive juices at the right time, prevents the, the gas and the bloating and the upset stomach and all the symptoms that come with indigestion. So it's a great digestive aid herb. The flowers are the medicine. I, a few years ago, was uh, cleaning up the raspberry patch and uh, was was moving the the branches aside to get in there and do some pruning and one of the the vines snapped out of uh, you know i was holding them back it it snapped and it managed to whip right across my face went between my glasses and my eye and scratched the cornea as it went through and I immediately lost vision. My eye teared up. It hurt like crazy. I ran into the house. I've had my cornea scratched before when I used to wear hard contact lenses. And it is extremely painful. And I thought, my first thought was, you know, find an optometrist find an eye doctor that I can go and get some of those drops that kind of anesthetize the cornea and then I thought wait a minute what can I do herbally what can I do right now here at home is that I didn't really want to wait a week to get in to see anybody and so I I went online and did a Google search and a lot of what I read said use German chamomile or use German chamomile and you know, I had I had not anticipated that using th that herb for this situation but I thought okay I've got chamomile and I've got these uh, these tea sacks you can get those on Amazon they're great little disposable bags that come in different sizes you can put different amounts of tea in there or herbs in there and then put it in a cup of boiled distilled water and make tea with it it's like a tea bag and so i had some of those i put the chamomile in there got the herbs wet didn't really need to make a tea because they were all the information that i had found said you know get a tea bag and put chamomile in it, get it wet, and then put it on your eye like a poultice. So that's what I did, and within minutes, the, the pain started to go away. Within an hour, my vision came back, and I was astounded. I thought, <laughs> okay, I'm never going to be without this one. It just has so many great first aid applications. It is um, it's a great herb to help you fall asleep if you have trouble falling asleep. I have another story to tell. So a few years ago, I got a really bad sore throat and had read that uh, raspberry red raspberries, the fruit, and chamomile make a good combination for sore throats. So I've made a syrup out of the berries and steeped some chamomile herb in that and kept that in the refrigerator and uh, tasted, tasted so good I thought I could put this on my pancakes. And it it um, it helped the sore throat, and I had it on pancakes one morning for breakfast, and about an hour later thought I need to go take a nap. So I recommend I recommend it on ice cream or 
pancakes or French toast or any kind of breakfast like that, waffles, but have those for dinner instead of breakfast if you're going to use that syrup because it will make you feel like you could go to sleep. You also uh, keep that in the fridge for me. Yeah, I keep that in the refrigerator for my husband who he's on the phone a lot and um, his throat gets really dry and sore from talking so much. And so uh, I keep that in the refrigerator and he'll go take a spoonful every break and, and it really helps with that. About a week after my sore throat episode, I got a uh, spasmodic cough, the kind of cough that hits you just all of a sudden and you cough, 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 and <gasps> try to breathe and then cough, 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 sort of like whooping cough, but not as bad. And um, I just, you know, it hit me out of the blue and I thought, oh, okay, I need an antispasmodic. Uh, do I go grab the lobelia tincture or what else can I use? Because um, I'll talk about lobelia here in a minute. You get too much, it'll make you throw up. So I, I thought chamomile. Chamomile is antispasmodic. It helps. I mean, it's a, it's a calmative. So, and I thought, I've got chamomile raspberry syrup in the fridge. So I ran to the fridge and I got the the syrup out and I took two or three spoonfuls and within 30 seconds the coughing slowed down and started to stop and eventually resolved. So every time I started coughing I would grab the syrup and that would help. I found that coughing, your body is coughing for a reason. It's trying to get the nasties out of the lungs so you don't want to suppress the coughing, you want to make your coughing productive. And the best herb to make, well, I shouldn't say the best, but one of the best herbs to make your coughing productive is mullen. And I have mullen growing in my herb garden. And you just make a tea out of the leaves and do that, take that tea during the day. It makes you cough, but it makes that cough productive. It helps you get the nasties up. Um, my daughter called me one, one day and said she had a friend who was hacking, had a hacking cough and needed help. And so I said, well, come on over and get some mullein leaves. And she made a, a tea out of those mullein leaves, gave it to her friend. And within 24 hours, she had coughed everything up that the body was trying to get rid of and the cough went away. So I recommend coughing during the day and and then taking this chamomile raspberry syrup at night so that you can rest because you don't want to be coughing all night while you're trying to rest. So your body needs to get rid of the nasties that are in the lungs. It also needs good rest. So mullein during the day, raspberry chamomile syrup on your pancakes or straight from the jar at night to help you rest. So this, Good no, combination. No, no, this, chamomile. this is German chamomile. This is German chamomile. Yes, there is a Roman chamomile. Roman chamomile is generally more uh, culinary. It's used, has more culinary purposes and I think they flavor liquors with it. So for medicine, and there are some herbalists out there who say they're interchangeable. I have not tried Roman chamomile as a nervine or a comative or for di as a digestive aid, so I can't speak to that. But I know from my own experience, German chamomile has really good medicine in it. Comfrey. Comfrey has a nickname called Knit Bone because it helps bones knit back together. It is, it's probably got a mucilage content of around 35%, which is really high for the plants that have mucilage in them. Mucilage is a, a demulcent. It is very, it's a soothing aspect 
of the plant's chemistry that when uh, the mucilage comes in contact with water, it turns, turns into kind of a gooey slime that is very soothing to mucous membranes. It is, comfrey is a good vulnerary, which means that it helps wounds heal. It, it, it is a cell proliferant, which means that it helps cells reproduce faster, wounds heal faster, you get better faster. Great first aid herb to have. The roots and the leaves are the medicine. The root is probably more powerful than the leaves. Uh, but I don't know that I want to dig up my comfrey plants and harvest the roots. Uh, I, I'd rather have this growing all the time in my herb garden. This is another one of those first aid herbs that I would want to have on hand all the time. So the demulcent aspect of the, the plant is very, it's soothing for wounds, burns, abrasions, bruises, cuts, rashes as, as, a, as a poultice or as a compress. It will help broken bones heal faster. Does have some pain relieving aspects. The mucilage is good on sore throats, good for coughs, arthritis, strains and sprains. Lots of first aid applications for this plant. Now the FDA will tell you that you should not take this plant internally and that's because somebody did a study where they fed lab rats or lab animals something like 30% of their diet was comfrey and they developed liver lesions and so the FDA said you know don't take this plant internally so I would say don't feed this plant internally to your pet lab rats or your mice or your or your rats, especially at you know 30% of their diet. I would not eat this at 30% as 30% of my diet, but a little bit it has been used for in teas for centuries without any harmful side effects. So you do the research. I always say do your own research. Make your own decisions. Make an intelligent decision based on what you have studied, what you um, have learned from your own health practitioner, and decide you know, if you want to use this plant internally or not. Purple cone flower, also known as echinacea, is famous for being a good immune system stimulant. It, it, it works really, really well to boost the immune system, to, to stimulate the immune system into action at the very first sign of a cold or the flu. That's when you start to get that tickle in your throat and you say, huh, I wonder if I'm coming down with something. That's when you want to take Echinacea. You don't want to wait until you say, oh, okay, I, I definitely have a, something uh, cold or a flu starting. You want to take it at that first sign of, you know, when you're just beginning to wonder. That's when it's going to work the best. Um, <clears throat> Echinacea is also a powerful herb for venomous snake and spider bites. Venomous snake, the venom of snakes and poisonous spiders has an enzyme in it called hyaluronidase, which dissolves the glue that holds your cells together. Uh, what the venom does is it starts to liquefy the victim of its bite so that the snake or the spider can slurp up the, the victim, uh, especially spiders. They don't eat you whole, they, they slurp you up. <laughs> and the venom in most of the poisonous snakes that are around our area have that same hyaluronidase in it. It will start to, um, 
your 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 skin will just start to slough away. It'll liquefy and slough away. It's not it's not pretty. If you go to the doctor, the doctor's going to say, "I'm sorry, there's nothing I can do for you." But if you are herb smart, you know that echinacea has hyaluronic acid in it, which promotes the production of the glue that holds your cells together. And so the, it is a good remedy to have on hand for venomous snake and spider bites. And because we have hobo spiders here, I think we have brown recluses here, and um, we do have rattlesnakes in some parts of Idaho. So this is one of those herbs I would not want to be without. I would want to have this on hand. I'd want to have this herb with some other herbs with it. And I think I've got a good recipe for a, a snake and spider bite formula that you can make into a poultice that you'd want to get on your wound right away. Um, I would keep that in my back door apothecary so it is handy and ready to use <clears throat> when you need it. The roots and the leaves are both the medicine. The roots are stronger in their medicine, but they have to be at least three-year-old roots. So this is a plant that if you want to grow it for medicine, you'll need to kind of rotate three groups of it so that you can always harvest three-year-old roots and still have a uh, other plants coming up behind for the next season that you can harvest and just kind of plant that on a rotational basis so that you always have that herb on hand. Dry it and keep it in your your backdoor apothecary so that it's handy. The culinary value is limited to an herbal tea probably with the leaves I would do that uh, or the, keep it if on hand as a cold and flu remedy, get the dried roots or the dried leaves for that. Echinacea is really good for upper respiratory issues. That's when you've got a cold in your head. So the congestion or the runny nose, the sinus congestion, headaches. Uh, when that cold moves into your lungs, you want to stop using echinacea and you want to switch to a different set of herbs. I talk about that in my reference manual uh, because if you continue to take echinacea for an upper respiratory issue, you're, you could start a cytokine storm and that's going to make your symptoms feel a whole lot worse. So know your herbs, know when to use them, when to switch to different herbs, when your symptoms change, and just modulate that whole event based on what's going on. Fever Few is a real pretty little daisy-like flower, very similar in appearance to chamomile. Real easy to confuse the two, except that the leaves are very different. And Feverfew has a good reputation for helping with migraine headaches. And I talk about migraine headaches in my herbal reference manual. I have experience with those. People who like Feverfew for migraines, good to have this, this herb growing. Um, it, you just eat two, three, or four of the leaves a day just out of the garden. Chew those up. Um, that is supposed to help prevent the migraines. There are different triggers and different causes of migraine headaches. For me, the biggest, uh, w what resolved my migraines was magnesium. My daughter-in-law, uh, heard that magnesium helps with migraine headaches, so I started doing some research. I came across Dr. Carolyn Dean. 
She's a naturopath, an herbalist, an acupuncturist, a nutritionist. She's a medical doctor. She's a lecturer. She's a consultant. She's an author. She has written lots of free ebooks that are available on her website. And, and she's written a book about, um, a published book that I bought about, mag the, I think it's called The Magnesium Miracle. Uh, magnesium is responsible for something like over 750 enzymatic functions in the body. So if you are magnesium deficient, that could lead to over 65 diseases or illnesses or health issues. She talks about those in her book. And one of those is migraine headaches. And so she developed a, a liquid magnesium supplement where the magnesium is picometer size. That means it is so small, it bypasses digestion and goes immediately into your cells where your cells need it. <clears throat> Um, she mentioned in one of her books that when you take a magnesium supplement or you eat foods that are high in magnesium, your liver will keep about 20 to 40 percent of that magnesium and discard the rest. So any magnesium that goes <coughs> excuse me, through the digestive process, you're going to lose 80, 60 to 80 percent of that magnesium. So she developed this ionic picometer size ma liquid magnesium to um, kind of avert that, that problem. And I have started taking her liquid magnesium three years ago. And in that three years have only had one migraine headache. And that was because I had neglected to take the, the minerals for a couple of days and I got a doozy of a migraine. So I am a convert to the liquid magnesium. I'm a convert to the importance of magnesium and other minerals in your diet for health. I think, personally, I think that a lot of the health issues that we have are, you know, the root cause is we're either eating the wrong foods or we're not eating the right foods and we're not eating foods that are nutrient dense and that's one of the reasons why we subscribe to the mitt lighter gardening method so that we can we can grow our own food that is nutrient dense <clears throat> Dr. Jacob Mitlighter found that plants need 16 nutrients to be healthy and productive and nutrient dense and he made the recipe available to the world uh, you can find that recipe you can find that uh, how to grow nutrient dense food in the mitt lighter gardening course book which is available on the LD at the lds prepper store and the micronutrients which are <laughs> sorry the micronutrients, which are hard to hard to source and hard to find, we provide those so that you can add that to what you can get at the uh, garden centers to grow nutrient dense food. Oh, my husband just brought in. This is Remag. This is the liquid magnesium. What? Bring it closer to the screen. Oh. So you get a look at it. Feverfew has a really good uh, um, first aid applications for skin irritations. It's antibacterial, helps with allergies, asthma, anxiety, and stress, and with headaches. Lots of health benefits other than just helping with migraine headaches. Garlic is nature's great antibiotic. Um, grow it. Keep it in your fridge. Have it on hand at all time. It's antiseptic. The bulb, the cloves are the, the medicine. However, you need to crush those cloves. And it's the, it's the interaction 
when you break the cells of the clove, it's the interaction with the allicin and the sulfur that creates the medicine. So you don't want to, you know, take a clove and swallow it whole like a capsule. That's not going to do you much good. You want to crush or chop the, the cloves to bring out the medicine. It's good for infections. It's a good expectorant, which means it helps you cough, makes your coughing productive. It's good for colds and flu. It does have some deworming properties, good for earaches, good for altitude sickness and allergies. Lemon balm, one of another one of my favorite herbs to have on hand. It's, this is like uh, chamomile. It's a calmative. It's a nerving. Tastes really good, so kids love the tea. And uh, you just make a tea with it, add some honey and lemon, drink that in the evening. It helps calm down your mind so that you can fall asleep easily. It's also an antiviral specific for the herpes virus that causes cold sores. Uh, good to turn the, the plant into an ointment or a lotion that you can apply to a cold sore. Or you can just take the, you can just make a poultice out of the plant and apply it to the cold sore. Put a band-aid over it if you can or whatever. The leaves are the medicine. It is a great culinary herb, good in salads, in dressings, baked goods. I've had it in <clears throat> scones and cookies, or not cookies, uh, maybe cookies, but like uh, like a zucchini bread, uh, uh, a quick bread. It's a really good lemon, lemon balm quick bread. Put it in smoothies, juice it. It has lots of good culinary value. I've got some good recipes in my reference manual. Good for cold sores, helps with migraines, flu and fevers, and makes a good insect repellent. I mentioned lobelia earlier that it, if you take too much, will make you throw up. It is anemetic when used at high doses. It is an antispasmodic and a pain reliever when used at lower doses. <clears throat> it is a deobstruent, which means it helps pull things out of the body. The leaves and the seeds are the medicine. It has no culinary value. Dr. Christopher used lobelia and peppermint for asthma. He would give his clients, he would have them drink peppermint tea um, for about an hour and then he would give them uh, lobelia in in um, small doses every few minutes until they started to throw up and that's when he knew he had given them enough it helps uh, get the 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 mucus that's clogging up the the bronchioles in your lungs it helps get that out it resolves asthma good for bronchitis and coughs it will induce vomiting if you take something that is non-caustic, that is toxic. It, take it at, in large enough doses to make you vomit. It can resolve uh, that non-caustic poisoning. Good for infections. Uh, has been used for rabies and earaches, and tetanus. So I go into more detail about all of those different health benefits and first aid applications in my reference manual. Mullen is a weedy herb that is found along irrigation ditches everywhere here in southeastern Idaho, probably other places too. I've seen it up in the mountains, all over the place. It's very distinctive once it gets its flower spike. It's actually quite a pretty plant. It's good for upper respiratory issues, like I mentioned before, my daughter using the leaves for coughs. The flowers are good for ear infections. It's really good in combination with garlic. Make an oil infusion of the mullein flowers and the garlic and uh, drop that into an infected ear for earaches. It really works really well that way. The leaf, the flower, and the root are the medicine. 
The tea that you make from the leaves is mildly bitter. The flowers are bitter, but they're a little bit sweeter. The flowers have been used to flavor liquor. Other than that, it doesn't really have any good culinary value. When you make a tea with it, the, the leaves are very fuzzy. And so that fuzz will come off in the water. So you want to strain your tea through a coffee filter before you drink it because the, the fuzz can be kind of irritating to your throat. Um, good for coughs, bronchitis has helped with whooping cough, colds and flus, has antibacterial properties and helps with pain. So if you've got this growing out in the wild around your house, you can wildcraft it. If you've got um, an, a neglected area on your property, mullein will do well there too. Good old parsley, great herb, good diuretic, which means that it, it makes you pee. What it does is it helps the body draw fluids that are stuck and stagnating in the body, moves them to the kidneys for filtering, and then out for elimination. So it's good for edema. It's, it will, the, the root, parsley root, is really good for breaking up kidney stones, it will help break up gallstones. Anytime you've got any swelling or edema where you're retaining water, it will help resolve that. It's good for bruises, it's a good dissolvent, Lots of good medicinal applications. The leaves, the roots, and the seeds are the medicine. And, of course, add it to lots of things that you cook with. Soups and salads, smoothies. You can juice it. Put it in sandwiches. There's lots of, way, lots of ways to incorporate it in cooking. If, you know, they used to serve a sprig of parsley on your plate when you'd go to restaurants. It was, it was put there as a garnish, but it would... Pro probably would have been the most nutritious thing on the plate and most people just ignore it. So if you go to a restaurant and they garnish your plate with a sprig of parsley, eat the parsley. It's good for you. Peppermint. Good digestive aid. It is a stimulant herb. Not meaning stimulant like coffee is stimulant but meaning that it increases activity in the body. It will increase blood circulation, which helps get other herbs that you take with it, helps diffuse those herbs through the body. So that's what I mean by stimulant. It increases blood circulation, which will help diffuse medicinal herbs through the body quickly. The leaves are the medicine, they taste great. They, can, they have great culinary value in salads as a tea, uh, put them in smoothies. There's lots of ways to use all of the mints in cooking. Good for indigestion, good for nausea, although I think spearmint is probably a little bit better for nausea than peppermint, but they both help with digestive issues. Good for dizziness and fainting, aches and pains, earaches, colds and flu, diarrhea, lots of good first aid applications. Plantain is one of those herbs that I would want to have in my herb garden all the time. It is an alterative, which means that it helps the body move from illness to wellness over an extended period of time. Good for blood poisoning. Um, good for snake bites and spider bites. Good for skin eruptions. The roots, the leaves, and the flowers, and the seeds are all medicinal. You can harvest the leaves when young and put them in salads, or you can steam them like spinach. The seeds kind of have a nutty flavor. There is a variety of plantain where the seeds are actually harvested. Um, they're called The seeds are called psyllium, and the um, mucinex, is it mucinex? I can't remember which laxative uses psyllium seeds as the main ingredient in, in its um, laxative product that you can you can buy commercially. So if you grow that variety and need a laxative, you can harvest the seeds and use it for that. Helps with um, insect bites and stings, stops bleeding, helps heal wounds. It's got mucilage in it. 
It's great for burns, good for toothaches, lots of good first aid applications. Red raspberry leaves. I, I make a tea out of these leaves all the time. It's good for pretty much every female reproductive issue. It's an astringent, which means that it tightens and tones tissues. When you drink the tea, you feel that astringency because it makes your tongue feel dry. That's the astringent action. Uh, the, the fruit is also medicinal, as I mentioned in my recipe for raspberry chamomile syrup. The leaves um, are good for tea, lots of culinary uses for the berries. Other than it's astringency, well, it's astringency helps with diarrhea, helps stop bleeding, helps with burns, helps with canker sores, it's good for colds and flu. It's very mild, so it's good for young children. Has lots of really good uh, first aid applications. Stinging nettle has uh, been used for arthritis and rheumatism. Some say that you just take a stalk of stinging nettle and kind of flagellate yourself with it you know, on, the, on your joints that have arthritis. That stinging is supposed to, I mean, it hurts, but the, the formic acid in the, in the little barbs that cause the stinging are supposed to help with arthritis. So you can you can give that a try if you're desperate. Otherwise, you can take a nettle as a tea. Once the, the plant is dried, the young shoots or the dried plant don't have the sting in it anymore. So the stalks, the leaves, the seeds, and the roots are all the, have the medicine. It's good for urinary complaints. It's highly nutritive. It's a really good spring tonic to get your system up and going after a long winter. It can be used raw in salads as a pot herb, like spinach. You can put it into smoothies. You can make pesto out of it, but I'd use the young leaves that don't have the formic acid in it. Stops bleeding. It's good for upper respiratory issues, asthma, skin eruptions, warts. It helps with migraines. Really good with seasonal allergies. And the best way to use it for seasonal allergies is to get a freeze-dried commercial unless you have a freeze dryer and can freeze dry it yourself get the freeze dried capsules from a reputable herbal supplier my son who has used or who has seasonal allergies when they get really bad um, he uses the freeze dried nettle and says it helps quite a bit I think my daughter has used it also for her seasonal allergies. Good to start taking it a month or two before the the, the seasonal allergies hit and uh, kind of as a preventative that way. Finally, we have yarrow. Yarrow is famous for breaking fevers. It's a great diaphoretic. It's bitter, which means it's a good digestive herb too. So when you've got a fever that just will not resolve, the you know the, the herb in the hot water, the combination of hot water, hot water itself, is a good diaphoretic, which means it helps uh, helps you sweat, helps your body get the toxins out that it's wanting to get out, or the the um, you know, dead pathogens, you know, whatever it's trying to get rid of. Diaphoretic herbs help with that whole process. Yarrow is also a good plant for stopping bleeding. Uh, Doc Jones, a veterinarian out in the Twin Falls area, uses yarrow a lot in his veterinary practice. Not everybody appreciates a squirt of cayenne in the mouth, which also stops bleeding, so yarrow is a good substitute for that. The leaves, the flowers, and the root are the medicine. The root is anesthetic. Um, where did I hear? Somebody 
maybe it might have been Doc Jones said an old Boy Scout tr prank that the uh, 12 year olds would play on the 11 year olds when the 11 year olds would get to go on their first camp out with the big boys they'd find yarrow dig up the root and say here chew on this it's really cool and the the 11 year olds who want to be cool will chew on it and 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 it numbs the tongue it numbs the mouth sort of like when you go to the dentist and your mouth gets numb before the doctor does any dental work and you you know you you know that hot can't feel anything kind of feeling yarrow has the same kind of effect anesthetic effect in the mouth so um the boy scouts got a big kick out of playing that prank on on the 11 year olds who didn't know any better and wanted to be cool the the leaves can be eaten raw or cooked like spinach in salads and sautés, even in some desserts. Yarrow is good for earaches, it helps with uh, colds and flu, it's a good decongestion. It is astringent, it's good for diarrhea, it helps with gas and cramping and for colic. It has all those good digestive aid applications as well. So there you have it, 20 first aid herbs with over 230 applications and health benefits, which I go into more detail in my reference manual. All of these herbs can be grown here or cultivated here. Uh, my reference manual has photos to help you identify the herbs, tips on how to grow these herbs, and what is the, what is the best remedy for each plant. Is it best taken as a tea? Is it best taken as a tincture? Can you do both? Um, so, lots of information and photos, primary, secondary uses, other health benefits, um, place to keep notes. I've got recipes in here to for for culinary and for herbal preparations. Well, I'm pretty much done. Would you please don't touch anything? Okay, well. We have questions? No. Nope. No questions today? Please keep talking. I don't know. Well, thanks for listening. As I mentioned, I have a website. You can go there, get more information on the medicinal weeds, check back often at the backyardherbalistschool.com, and uh, I'll be adding more information about herbs on a regular basis. So last week, Sue talked about the, the backyard herbalist medicinal weeds yeah, you can see that is on our website uh, we had lots of orders she had to go print more of these books last week uh, these are great great books to have so you like she mentioned uh, you can get this at LDS Prepper store this talks about the the weeds that are growing in your backyard then today she talked about the first aid she these are all of her years of research it puts this in here this is a great, great reference manual. Uh, she talked about kind of the 30,000 foot, um, you know, how these herbs can help. And she goes into much more detail on how to use those in that book. Next week, you want to make sure that you, uh, as soon as we announce the, um, the live presentation, that you put, click the reminder uh, on, on your uh, YouTube so that you will be able to see uh, all of the tinctures and and um, so I don't know how to get this without covering your face there. No, you can't. <laughs> okay, you'll be able to see. Uh, she goes into great details on making the herbal herbal remedies. They, the tinctures, the lip balms, the ointments, the teas, all those things in great detail. Recipes. Uh, 
So if you actually have this book, if you order this book um, now, and you can have that with you next week as she goes through these, that would be a great advantage to you. You'll be able to go through those recipes, look at them, see if you have any particular questions on the recipe, the formulas, uh, where to get the products and so forth. So you can order that. And then the week afterwards, she'll be talking about, I think, her thickest book, which is the culinary herbs and spices. And a lot of times we will use these great herbs and we'll uh, overcook them, and then we don't get the nutritional value from them. We get the flavor, but uh, not the nutritional value or the medicinal values from them. So she'll talk about that too. So share, share this video with your friends. Uh, thank you for liking the video. If you have questions, please post them down below. But Sue will be back next week. Let's see if I can turn this. That makes it a little bit easier. Oh, by the way, you see all these books behind us? This is not a um, green screen um, um, image behind us. You don't see my hand going through any kind of a microphone in front of us. <laughs> all right. Uh, if you take a look over here, these are all of her herbal books back here. Has I don't know, a lot of money in herbal books. Uh, lots of lots of material and get out of the way. That the whole column there is just all herbal books. So she is a, a student. Not only is she is a, a certified master herbalist. Uh, behind us are books on Isaiah and other things and so forth. So thank you very much for taking your time today, whether it's live or whether it's uh, in in the um, in the recording. Uh, she will come back through and answer any questions down below. And uh, hopefully this has been beneficial. Grab your books so you have those for reference next week. So you can post those questions. And we will see everybody next Saturday, 9 a.m. Mountain Time. And uh, we hope that you have a great weekend. This is Mrs. and Mr. LDS Prepper reminding you, if ye are prepared, ye shall not.